Welcome to worship. Psalm 19 is our scripture this morning. I'm going to read through it as a whole, and then we'll come back and look at it verse by verse. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, and night unto night shows knowledge. There's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them hath he set a tabernacle for the sun, which is as a bridegroom coming out of his chamber, and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. His going forth is from the end of the heaven, and his circuit unto the ends of it, and there's nothing hid from the heat thereof. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweeter also than honey in the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there is great reward. Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Keep back thy servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me. Then shall I be upright, and I'll be innocent from the great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Let's pray. Amen. Lord, we do thank you for this wonderful psalm this morning. We thank you for this time of year. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. And it is that time of year again. My favorite time of year in East Tennessee. Mid-September, we're slipping into October, and October is by far the best month to me. And then when October's over with, it'll be homecoming time, that first Sunday of November. And then when homecoming meal's over with, that's when I traditionally go on my fall vacation, which is my real vacation because the one in the spring is haycation, and I'm always glad just to get that one over with. But the one in the fall is when the preacher gets out and he takes a week and he just walks around in the woods. And it's just something about walking around in the woods that first week of November. The weather's usually good and I don't have to worry about stepping on rattlesnakes and the chiggers are gone and the sweat bees are gone and the mosquitoes that was eating Janice and us up last night, they're, they're gone. And it's just wonderful and just invigorating to be out in nature at that, that time of the year. It's just that perfect time when it's a... It seems like it's all positive and very few negatives to be out. But in this psalm, Psalm 19, I titled the message today, Two Good Books. There are two good books mentioned in this psalm, and they both have, both have the same author. And the author is the Lord, God. The first book the psalm mentions in verse 1 through 6 is the, the book of God's creation. Nature, we call it. The book of nature, if you would. After church Sunday night, I started home. I turned left on 411. I just passed Hardy's over there in Okoy, and I looked back to the left, and there's like maybe the best sunset that I saw all. Dad's shaking his head. He saw it too, that I've seen all year long. It was just layer after layer of that wonderful, brilliant pink layered with the blue sky in between, pink and blue, pink and blue, pink and blue. Wish I'd made a picture. I said I should have got out and made a picture, but I didn't. But it's here, and there'll be a different one every time that you see one, I guess. And God's a great, a great artist. But uh, that's what the bottom of verse 1 says in this psalm. It says, the firmament shows God's handiwork. That's the, when we look into the skies, we see God's handiwork. And, uh, and the, the top part of that same verse, the heavens declare the, the glory of God. I was out in the woods Wednesday, and we were having lunch. We'd been working hard, and I was sitting there eating lunch and finishing off the banana cream homemade ice cream. We split it up, by the way, sitting in the back of a pickup truck out in the woods. And I looked, and it, the, the weatherman had said Thursday morning. It was kind of muggy, but he said, there's all this dry air coming in about lunch. And while we were sitting there eating ice cream out in the woods, and the, that breeze started coming, and it, it just felt that energy you know it's just like oh that feels good and it's coming your know, fall's coming and 
and it was that September blue sky up there. We went looked at those smoky skies all summer long, but now we're getting some of that, that good azure blue sky, that September sky that, uh, that I like to call it. And you look up there and you think it just makes you feel good and it, it reminds you of God and how good God is. And you say, the heavens declare the glory of God. Amen. And when you see these sunrises and sunsets, it inspires you just to worship without saying, hey, it's 11 o'clock Sunday. <laughs> Whatever it is, you know, you just look up and it reminds you of God and you find yourself, that's true worship. You're just all inspired and when you remember there's a wonderful creator behind this creation. And when we, when we walk out at night and we look up in these clear skies and we see the moon and the stars and identify with David in Psalm 8. He said, when I consider the heavens, the moon and the stars, the work of thy fingers, he said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And then the next verse he says, and the son of man that thou visitest him. I think that's in the translation, I think what that means is, what is when I consider this great creation of yours, God, what is little old man that you're even mindful of him? And then the next line, I think, and what are we human beings that you would send your son to die for us, the son of man that you visitest him? You know, it's, it's I don't understand it. You know, I, I can read in the Bible and I say, hey, human beings are the highest order of God's creation, but... Uh, God's more loving and compassionate than I could ever be. I could even comprehend that he said, that bunch of miserable sinners down there, I'm going to send my son to die for them and redeem them. Mm -hmm. And we look around, we shake our heads and say, I, I, I don't know if I'd die for hardly any of these people anymore around here. But, but God says, I'll die for every one of them. They'll trust in me. I can, they can be redeemed. And that's really what we find out. <coughs> Let's go on verse 3. He starts talking about the sun and the heavens here. It says, there's no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. That's day and night, night and night. No matter what part of the world you live in, no matter what language you speak and you comprehend, you, you can look at God's creation and say there's, there's no language that can't understand that there's a creator behind the creation that's out here. And their line, their measuring line is going out through verse 4 through all the earth. And their words to the end of the world. In them he set a tabernacle for the sun, a place for the sun to dwell. And we'll translate that and say you can take this book, this book of nature, with you all over the planet. Anywhere you go, you can look up and say, there's a creator God. And then he even mentions their words, you know, the, the words of the sun and the moon and the stars. They, they go to the end of the world, and, and, and what are these words? That's creation's words. And what's creation telling us? Creation tells us that I'm the creation, but there's a creator behind it. There's a great work of art called creation, but there's always an artist behind the work of art. Verse 5. The son which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices as a strong man to run a race. Poetic language say the sun comes up and he runs a race across the heavens and, and the sun sets. Verse 6. He is going forth, the sun, as she went. It's from the end of heaven and his circuit to the ends of it goes from this side of it to that side of it. And there's nothing hid from the heat thereof. The sunshine finds everything. But his circuit is found to the ends of it. Circuit has to do with a, a circle. And it's interesting to me, Christopher Columbus looked at verses like these, and the one he really identified was the one out of Isaiah when everybody was going to the Indies to get spices. He said, yeah, he went to old Queen Isabella, and he says, you know, the Bible says that God is he that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. Now, science in Columbus's day in the 15th century was saying the earth is flat. <laughs> and they drew maps that had the ocean that went out there and they'd have sea monsters on the edge of the map or something. And they said, you know, you do, if you're dead, if you go past there, you just fall off the earth. It's flat. That, that was the science of the day. But Columbus says, you know, the Bible says that God sits on the circle of the earth. I believe I can go the opposite direction and find my way to the Indies that everybody else is going to find a better route. Now, we know the rest of the story. There's something in between him and the Indies, and he landed over here, and he saw 
people walking around. He says, oh, Indians. <laughs> and now you know why Native Americans begun to be called Indians. That was Christopher Columbus, but he was right. The earth was round. It's amazing that the oldest book in the Bible, Job, says that God hung the earth upon nothing. Now that's a long time ago for Job's language under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to say the earth's floating around in space. It, God didn't hang it up on nothing. It's just floating around out there. It, science has always just caught up with the Bible and confirmed everything that the Bible, Bible has said because God knew about his creation before we learn about his creation. Is it possible for anyone to go through an East Tennessee autumn and say there is no God? I can't comprehend that. You've got to really be wanting to convince yourself to walk out in an East Tennessee autumn and look at the beauty around us, the fields and the rivers and the mountains and the trees and the, and the critters and all this just wonder that we have. And somebody, how could they stand there and say that they're an atheist, that there is no God? Obviously, there's a creator behind it. But logic says if there is a God, then it is necessary that we, as his creation, answer to that God. And the first part of the psalm is that one good book about nature. God's nature preaches to us that there is a God. But then the remainder of the psalm says there's a second revelation of God that gives us more detail, and that's the Bible. The word of God. Nature declares, yes, there's a creator, but the Bible gives us more detail. Now let's look at verse 7. It's all The rest of the psalm is about the Bible. The law of the Lord is perfect or complete, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. So the law of the Lord, this is synonymous ways of saying the word of the Lord or the Bible. It's perfect. It's complete. We get the complete story from the Bible. Nature tells us there's a God, but it's only in the Bible that we find out how God entered his fallen creation at Bethlehem to redeem this fallen creation. That's the Bible story. It's the continuation of what nature just says. It says there is a God, and you better listen to him. And then God revealed in his book the complete story of it. <laughs> And the bottom of verse 7 says, The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. And I, I hope you're able to watch on Facebook our Sunday evening service. I'm having fun with Proverbs. We're chapter 2 tonight in, in Proverbs. And I'm using the outline that's just obvious to me all through Proverbs. It's, it's, it's a three-point outline. It says, first of all, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So number one is, Number one point from Proverbs is you fear God now. And if you watch it, the number two pro the point in Proverbs, now you fear God, then you get a good education. And then number three is don't be lazy. Slothfulness is all good. A different ways of being lazy is described. So the outline of Proverbs is you fear God, get a good education, don't be lazy. Now that's a formula for success for anybody in any society. Fear God. Gain all the knowledge that you can, and don't be lazy about it. But that first one, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Mm -hmm. Because without being God-fearing, without putting God, you can glean all kinds of information. We use the term sometimes people can become an educated fool. But you need that number one, first of all, the, you, you need a relationship with God through his word to keep you from being less misled with all the false information that's out there. Everything's got to be filtered through God's word. It says now the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the wisdom part. Knowledge is gathering information, but wisdom is being able to have the maturity and responsibility to handle the knowledge that you get. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So, that's what he said here in the bottom of verse 7. And the other one says, it'll make wise the simple. The Bible will make wise the simple. Simple is just a, a different way of saying the stupid. 
As you get in the Word, it says you'll get you'll wise up about some of this bad misinformation that you're bombarded with from the satanic world out here. In verse 8, he says, Now the statutes of the Lord, it's just another way of saying the Bible, the Word of God, the statutes of the Lord are right. Let that sink in. The, the Word of the Bible is right. God's teaching is right. The statutes of the Lord is right. Where do we find out where right and where wrong is? Well, if we just listen to society, it's whatever society says is right and wrong, which means society places itself in the spot of God to determine what's right and what's wrong. But as Christians, we say, no, it's not what they vote about. It's not what somebody's teaching about over here some more. It's what thus saith the Lord is right and what thus saith the Lord is wrong. Amen. God says there's a clear definition between light and and darkness. Society says, oh, there's a lot of gray area. Well, it may be gray sometimes for when we're trying to figure it out, but God's got the dividing line somewhere, and he says, this is wrong, and this is right, and the way we find that out is we get in the statutes of the Lord, the, the Bible, verse 8. Statutes of the Lord are right, rejoice in the heart. The commandment of the Lord's pure, enlightening the eyes. <coughs> Rejoicing the heart. Reading God's word and living by God's commandments, you know what? It, it, the world's looking for happiness, but they don't know where to look. They're looking in sin for happiness. They're looking in drugs and booze and sex and all the other stuff that's just ruining people's lives and destroying families. But the Bible says, you know, if you look to the Lord, listen to what he says, you'll find happiness. I've, I've said before, even if an atheist who says there is no God, tried his best to live by the Bible, I believe he'd have a lot happier life. Mm -hmm. And he'd keep himself out of a whole lot more trouble in this world. And if he'd come to believe the word of God and submit to the gospel story, he'd keep himself out of eternity of trouble too, wouldn't he? It leads to happiness. Doing the right thing leads to happiness and it is enlightening the eyes. It's an eye-open experience. An eye-open experience to, to read God's book by faith and love it and live by it. Verse 9, the fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. It's an eternal thing. The judgments of the Lord, it's another way of saying the Bible, the judgments of the Lord are true and they're righteous altogether. I'm sensitive about truth. The word of God is true. That's one thing we can count on this world that's true. Amen. Just about everything else, including our own opinions, we bring our own baggage to it, and it has some amount of biasness in it. And it, it, we're living in a world where spin rules. You watch one channel or the other, spin, and, and I've come up with my own little thought. Here's my bumper sticker for the day. Spin is sin. Because you can take a story, and you can even be on the good side of the story, but you build this straw man over here and make them look ridiculous and then you blow up your story to take it so far the other way that now it's a distorted story and a distorted story is distorted truth and a distorted truth in the bottom line of it is still a lie. Spin is sin and it's what's tearing our country apart today. The word of God is true. Lies are killing people. Verse 10. More, the word of God's more to be desired are they than gold. I'd like to find a bunch of gold, wouldn't you? I walk along the banks of Coker Creek every once in a while looking there and see if I see something litter. <laughs> they used to find a lot of gold up there. They still find a little bit. I'd like to have some gold. But I wouldn't trade the word of God for it. It's more to be desired than gold. Money, money's just to help get through this world, but the word of God is an eternal thing. Every, everything else will pass away, the Bible says. Be a new heavens and a new earth, but the word of God will stand forever. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Much fine gold. The word of God is sweeter also than honey. And the honeycomb was about the sweetest thing they had back in David's day when he wrote this psalm, I guess. But we can just sum this up and say that uh, 
God's word is invaluable. What would the world be like without it? We think the world's in a mess now, but we still, our, even our very laws here in America and most parts of the world are still based on <coughs> Judeo-Christian values. It still comes from the root of, of the word of God. That means by our law, we're defining what's right and what's wrong, and that's come from what the Bible tells us is right and what's wrong. <coughs> Verse 11. Moreover, by them, the words of God, is thy servant warned, and in keeping of them there's great reward. We read the Bible and it warns us to stay away from this stuff over here called sin because it just brings a lot of heartache and a lot of just problems with it that you don't want later on. It may be fun for the moment. The Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season, but it's just a little while, and then you say, well, I wish I hadn't got into that because now my life's just a, just a mess. So the Bible warns us. Ultimately, it warns us about eternity, too. And in keeping on, the flip side of the coin is, but if you do what the Bible says, there's great reward. There's great reward in this life. There's great reward in the, in the world to come. I mean, there's great reward in doing the right thing, just being able to go to bed at night and think they're not going to knock on my door tonight and bust me. Because I, I'm, I'm doing what God said to do instead of not what God said to do. Verse 12. Who can understand his errors? That, that's not God's errors. Who can understand our own errors? We, we've got sins that we don't even see sometimes that we can't even understand. But David says, but cleanse you, Lord, cleanse me from secret faults even. The ones I'm not even aware of. And God does that by... By grace through faith, but he also does it through empowering us through reading his word that God points out to us. And sometimes we realize that, hey, I'm on the wrong on this and I need to, need to get on the right side of God here. And cleanse me from that, David says. In verse 13, he says, now, now keep back thy servant from presumptuous sins. Now, I don't know if David wrote this before Bathsheba or not, but I think David knew he was God's man before Bathsheba, but he thought because he was God's man, he could get away with it. Don't the devil use that to tempt people today, too, that because you're, you're a Christian that you can presume upon God's grace? And that's a, that's a dangerous thing, and it's a sinful thing. Paul said, should we sin more that God's grace will abound? God forbid! God didn't give us grace so that we could sin more. So don't presume upon God's grace. Keep me back from presumptuous sins and don't let them have dominion over me. Don't let me get in bondage to them because that's what sin does. You'll get into a habit and you'll become in bondage to those sins. But if God will help me to avoid that, then shall I be upright. And I'll be innocent from the great transgression. I think that means when you get into little sins, if you ain't careful, then you'll get into the great big sins. <laughs> Cleanse me from the little ones before they lead me to the big ones, Lord. In verse 14, he says, Let, my, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, my strength and, and my redeemer. Acceptable words come from an acceptable heart. The mouth is what tells on what's in the heart a lot of times. Eh? Let my words be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord. You're my strength. And Jesus is my redeemer. Amen. Now to close and tie these two books together, which the psalm does, talks about two great books and one great author. Nature in the Bible is all authored by God, but there, it's not like two separate ones. One leads to the other one. And I say we need both revelations. First of all, I know from my own perspective that God re-energizes me through, through nature. I, I love being outdoors. During this time of pandemic, pandemic it's even more. I, I can go out and walk in the woods myself, and I've got zero chance of getting infected if there's nobody else out there. Mm -hmm. We're working out on the farm by myself, you know. There's zero chance getting it. Every time, every time you get around somebody, the, the odds go down a little bit, though, or up, however that would be. Even if it's just one, you know, you don't ever know, you know, kind of watch out. Then, then I know when I, I try to avoid it altogether. But once in a while, I have to go to Lowe's or I have to go to Walmart's. And right now, the odds go up astronomically to go in there. But boy, I can just, uh, you don't, there's this stress-free to be out, outside by yourself, ain't it? 
And, and there's something about just spending time out in nature that puts the rest of the world in its proper perspective for you. And I think we need that. In this time where the TV keeps people tore up all the time, it's good just to get away from it and get out in nature. One day, and just realize that there's a bigger picture than all this other stuff that people's all bitter and tore up about all the time, that it's just small potatoes compared to God's still on the throne and God still loves us. And, and uh, he has to shake his head at us sometimes. And, and if old King David, boy, he needed it. Then he, he, Psalm 23, we didn't read it this morning, but... Uh, he liked to walk beside the still waters and lay down in the green pastures because he said, that restores my soul. Amen. There's something about it, ain't it? It just gets, puts things in perspective. It's just like soul restoration. You just feel good when you spend a day in the outdoors. We've got a word for it today, when you, whether you're going hunting or fishing or canoeing or whatever. We're recreation. That comes from two words, or hyphenated word, Recreation. Like God creates a new spirit in us when we've been in the outdoors for a while. And I'll say this for you uh, married ladies. Hopefully there's some of them watching those few in here. But if you let your husband go out in the woods every once in a while, if he wants to go deer hunting or whatever it is, you probably have a happier marriage in the long run. Because there's just something about that that we, we need that to get away from things and just get things in the right perspective every once in a while. But we need to hear God in his written word too. And that's what our organized church is about. We need both revelations. Let's just close with this. David closed with, Lord, let me have an acceptable, let my words be acceptable in thy sight. And I said acceptable words coming from an acceptable heart. So I'll ask you a question this morning. Do you have an acceptable heart before God? Your words will reveal that. And there's only one way to be accepted in God's eyes. We're, the Bible says we're accepted in the beloved. That's talking about Jesus. We're accepted to God when we place our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because he's accepted, we're in Christ, and now we are accepted and that's a life-changing experience. It's not just something we make up my categories about. When we really trust Christ, it does something inside of us. It changes us, our attitude and our outlook. We're accepted in the beloved. And, and the good news still today is that no matter who we are, or where we've been, or what we've done, by grace through faith, God will still accept us. I don't know why. <laughs> But God loves us that much. Paul didn't know why. Who can comprehend the love of God, he said. And he said, it's a peace that passes all understanding down here on earth. But you just have to experience it. You don't have to know why, but you know that he does. He'll accept you by his grace through your faith in the gospel story of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you. For this wonderful Psalm 19, Paul alluded to it over in Romans 1 as we read earlier, but uh, we just thank you for this wonderful revelation of God that we find in the great outdoors, and thank you for the continuing, more detailed revelation of how you entered into your creation to redeem us and set things right for etern out into eternity. Lord, we thank you for the gospel story that by grace through faith, we can trust Jesus and still be accepted in the beloved. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. One twenty.